Will, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Glad to be here. Well, well, I've never had a financial archaeologist on the show, and that's what we have here today. We're going to be taking a deep dive into the history of finance and making applications to where we find ourselves today. But I want to take a walk kind of through your history because you have a really interesting history that is as an archaeologist, a historian, a TV producer, an art museum director. How did all of this lead you to quantitative finance? Well, yes, I do have a checkered background. I, I uh, I had lots of passions uh, throughout my uh, early life, and, and some of them had to do with archaeology and, uh, and art. And um, I was lucky enough to bring those along with me as I developed interest in a career in studying finance. So I didn't throw them over the side. I sort of uh, explored how finance intersects with other things like like art and like history. So uh, uh, that experience still stood me in good stead, even though I'm a finance professor and not an excavator in the ancient Near East anymore. <laughs> That's right. But but you did spend time as actually an archaeologist in your younger years, right? Digging up bones and exploring Mesopotamia and areas such as that? Absolutely. I mean, what better thing to do when you're young to go out and dig up ancient cities and explore South Texas. I, I had a great time and it was really driven by an excitement about what we can learn from the past and trying to understand the lives of people, you know, thousands of years ago. No, plenty of adventure uh, to build on. Yes, absolutely. And have you found your field of financial archaeology as interesting as some of the other archaeological uh, explorations you've done? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, one of the things that I've done throughout my career in finance is uh, collect prices for things that, well, stock prices, for example, that people didn't really know existed. And uh, to dig back into where did stocks come from, where did corporations come from, and you know, there's still hidden archival material that you can go to and and answer some of those questions so it's been uh, really exciting mm. to 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 discover that and then of course for me when i dig stuff up it's often numbers uh so i can study the long term behavior of stock markets and the payoff to investing uh various kinds of asset classes that that, that well, let's face it, all of us uh, at the age I'm at are interested in. Well, let's start at the most basic. And this takes us to your book, Money Changes Everything, How Finance Made Civilization Possible, which we're giving away today. I, well, the most basic question has to be, and I think this is one that most of us get wrong, what is money? Well, money is both tangible like a coin or a piece of paper, and also intangible, like something that could be a, a promise that you've given to somebody to pay them in the future, some exchange of, of value, some representation of value. And, you know, civilizations existed long before we had coins or what we would call money, but they still kept records and uh, kept a, a, a set of promises that were exchanges of value. Um, but they just, the earliest civilizations, for example, that had writing systems, their money was mostly a transfer of, of accounts as opposed to uh, metal coins that, that emerged actually much later than the first cities and, and societies. And what do we get wrong about the function of money or the function of finance for that matter? Well, um, you know, I remember a time in my life where I didn't really understand what finance was. And because, uh, you know, we, we experience it in so many different uh, contexts where sometimes it makes us anxious. Sometimes we ask ourselves, well, you know, what is this? And it has such a powerful effect on our lives and retirement and savings and so forth. But uh, at its very fundamental, finance is about the transfer of value through time. 
So a loan, for example, is a classic financial instrument, a contract. Um, you give some money to somebody today and they promise to pay you in the future. So that's like a time machine, really. The money in the future is moved to the present through that promise. And uh, so, you know, the person gets the money today, they can buy a house, uh, even if they didn't have the cash on hand to do so. The other side of that bargain is the person that lends the money passes that value that they have today into the future when they think they, they're going to need it more. So, for example, in retirement, we, we save money up, but we invest that money so that it will grow and be there uh, when, when we need it. Mm, I like that definition as, as a time machine. I don't think we often necessarily think of it that way, but that really makes a lot of sense. I've never heard it put quite in, in that context. Yeah, and when I look at your book and one of the things that you've said just in the book and, and just in general, I mean, it's in the title of the book, How Finance Made Civilization Possible. It, it sounds almost too simplistic to say finance made civilization possible. It sounds very Malcolm Gladwell-esque. Well, thank you. (laughs) Well, uh, the title really is all about um, asking why we care about finance at all. You know, why is it important? You know, could it be just some kind of peculiar thing that's not part of the real economy? That that would be a critique of finance. That it's it's an abstraction and uh, and not a uh, a real an actual uh, part of, um, of the economy. But I think about finance as kind of the infrastructure uh, for solving these problems of, of time and value. And when you build a big building, you know, a complex structure, it takes infrastructure, it takes plumbing, uh, it takes engineering in order to make something really large possible. You know, skyscrapers need to have elevators. We need to uh, pump the water all the way up 100 floors. When civilization, and by that I mean it, uh, intense uh, urban societies where you had a lot of people living in one place, that those were societies where people couldn't go out and get catch their own food. We had to have ways of uh, feeding people, of, uh, of maintaining their health, of, of defending uh, their uh, cities. And that meant you had to have ways of transferring value, both across space and across time. You know, some of the most interesting ancient cities Let's take ancient Athens, for example. You know, when Plato and Socrates were living in Athens, Athens couldn't even grow its own food in Greece. It had to send ships out to the Black Sea and to, 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 to Egypt to, to, uh, to collect rain. So where does finance come in? You had to have some way of financing that trade. Uh, People had to be able, you had to get money to buy the grain. You had to have coins in order to uh, pay the sailors. And so the financial system around ancient Athens really evolved as a way to support a city that was really important, uh, high density, but didn't have the capacity for growing the crops that that were needed to to feed the, the people. You know, when we look back throughout history and I look at the, a lot of the, the headlines and the articles that come out and individuals that are trying to, it seems in, in many cases, they're trying to grab as many eyes as they possibly can, but they're looking at the history, largely in the way of the financial markets. This is what's happened in the past, and this is where we find ourselves today, and this is going to happen again because this is what happened in the past. Now, from a civilization standpoint, when you look at the rise and fall of nations throughout history, where do you find a point in history that most resembles where the U.S. finds itself today? Well, that's a really interesting, slightly loaded question. And it's something that I think about a lot in my current research, which is how do we use history to inform ourselves about our current situation? Mm-hmm. I would say whenever the stock market 
crashes, I will get a call from somebody saying, how big is this crash compared to the crash of 1987 or 1929? History becomes this yardstick to measure how big a deal the current, you know, the current uh, situation is in the economy. But also, as you just asked, is there a lesson in some of those big events in the past that might help us predict what will happen going forward? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is yes and no. Sometimes the lessons uh, are uh, spookily similar, and, and sometimes they, they just um, don't follow the, the pattern. I'll give you a, a kind of a, well, it's an important example. You know, 1929 was a, a huge crash in the stock market. And then it was followed by a depression that lasted a long time. And so people think about that crash of 29 as, if not causing the, the, the uh, De Great Depression, at least preceding it. So when there's a big crash, the first thing that people have in their minds is, uh-oh, is this the beginning of, the, uh, of a terrible recession? Now, in 1987, the United States had a crash where the market went down like 21% in a space of a, well, one day, actually. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that comes to mind, it came to mind at that time was, uh-oh, 1929, are we going to follow that pattern? Well, strangely enough, by the end of the year in 1987, the market had bounced back in a way that it didn't bounce back in 1929. And so, you know, it was a head fake by the, by, by the, by the gods of randomness, I guess. But so um, we have so few examples of these giant events. We... Uh, we would like to learn from them, but sometimes the future doesn't follow that pattern in the, uh, from the past. So this time really is different. It could be different. <laughs> and, 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 you know, right now, uh, if you look on something like Google Trends, you'll see in the last few months, people, a lot of people have been looking up the word stagflation. Uh, why? Because um, that was a period, you know, 1970s and, and, and early 80s in the United States, there was a period of inflation that was also associated with low growth, uh, that, hence the word stagnation and inflation put together. That uh, is something that we're all thinking about um, because it's our recent history and we're worried about, you know, could, could we go back into a period where we have low growth and uh, and high spiral, spiraling prices. Well, you know, if you look in, in, in prior periods where people have also looked up stagflation, like the early 2000s, you know, uh, it didn't come to pass. The, 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 the stagflation didn't come to pass. So, but but it doesn't mean that we should ignore history because we don't have very many giant shocks and inflation events and so forth to to learn from. So, you know, we can't ignore them, but we don't want to get fixated on them. And we don't want to put too much um, expectation into the uh, history repeating itself. And this is where I'm guiding you. I just the other day, I was listening to talk radio, and they're talking about this is the Great Depression all over again, and they're isolating just a couple of unique events, uh, attributes of where we find ourselves today, and, and isolating that at some fixed point in the past. And to me, I, I'm wondering, as, as an individual that's listening to these headlines that, oh, well, this is going to be the Great Depression because of these two things or these three things, I just myself don't feel that we could ever take any point in time and make that a predictor of where we find ourselves today because there's just entirely too many variables that have been introduced since really any point throughout history. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with that 100%. One of the things that I did in my research is I said, let me go back and find every single 
case where the stock market has dropped by 50% in one year. So that's a crash. However you want to mm -hmm. look at it, uh, you know, adjusting for inflation and so forth. So what happens after a big crash? And what I found is that there were a lot of those in world uh, financial history. I'm talking about looking across all the different countries, looking back to uh, looking back 100, well, 120 years now. So you, you collect all that data and you say, well, I think I know what happens. I mean, I remember 20, I, 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 I know about 29. I know uh, about some other crashes. In fact, you're, after a big event like that, the market is just as likely to double in value in the year following it as it is uh, to, to, to lose, again, 50%. In other words, it's a coin flip whether it's going to go back up versus keep on going down. And if you look over the next five years, it's very likely to, to increase in value. So, you know, that sort of, um, that to me suggests that holding for the longer term, if you can manage it because of liquidity concerns, even when the markets are in extraordinary turmoil, the longer term outlook is pretty positive. So the, the, the risk on the one hand is, is um, the fear of, uh, of losing everything, but the risk on the other hand is missing out on the long-term growth in stock market assets. Yeah, I mean, I, I've listened to a couple of individuals here recently, uh, Neil Howe, uh, as well as Ray Dalio, right? Two individuals that are leveraging history to share with us a very bleak future that we face as a country, as a civilization. Um, what, would you be willing to speak to some of that research or those thoughts? Well, well we, need, we always need some pessimists to keep us uh, in line. But, you know, my interest to, over, the, over my career has been focused on um, the return to investing in the stock market. And, you know, there are a couple of very simple lessons. And they're really lessons for people who may not be experts. Uh, and I count myself as one of those experts in forecasting. The, the, uh, the, the equity market has been a way for people to share in the long-term growth uh, of the economy. So <clears throat> the public stock markets, the way I look at them, are these really special things that, that allow uh, a person that's not a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur to actually share in the, the profits that entrepreneurs generate by creating corporations. And so we're all in some sense in this together if we all own the equities of the uh, U.S. economy. And so there aren't too many other ways that you can share in the collective growth uh, uh, of the U.S. and also of the global economy other than through the, these equity markets. But, you know, there are times when they get bumpy. And uh, suddenly you find yourself, instead of floating on a placid lake, you know, rolling down the Colorado River in, a, uh, in an inflatable boat hoping you can hold on. But you know, the long-term growth that you get out of investing uh, collectively in, in, the, in the economy through stocks reflects the compensation uh, for those risks that you're taking. So that's, that's pretty, that's something that, that, that most economists are comfortable with kind of characterizing, which is the trade-off between risk and return uh, for investing in, in, in equities. But um, sometimes you get some very pessimistic outlooks about, about long-term growth. And, and um, you know, you just hope that, that, that the growth that we've experienced over the last, and I'm talking centuries, 
uh, is going to continue to uh, pay off for those investors that that can share in it. So I take it you're not one of the pessimists. You're you're one of the optimists. Uh, if if that is the case, I, I mean, are there any things that you're doing personally from for your own financial situation or from an investment standpoint? Uh, when you take a look back throughout history, take a look at where we're at today, have you made any shifts over the last one, two, three years? Well, one thing is I don't look at my portfolio very often when the market goes down. And that's a, is that a shift for you? <laughs> You know, it's very tempting to watch your portfolio and the market is going up and up and up. It's just human nature. But I think that you will feel better if you don't look at your portfolio when it's going down. And, you know, it's silly to say that you might feel better, but, you know, investing is a human. It's it, it's a human activity and it's full of emotion. and. So, you know, one thing about uh, behavioral economics is uh, it, it, it's taught us that you can make mistakes if you follow your, your, your emotions on, on things. Uh, so, you know, step one before I make any changes in my portfolio is to try and get a handle on where my emotions are about the about responses to the market and fears about what could happen and so on and and i think that stood me stood me in good stead i have a kind of a a personal view from my research that stocks over the long term do pretty well but i'll tell you a little bit of i'll tell you a story about that that when i say over the long term I'm talking about centuries and centuries. Mm -hmm. I have some some co-authors that I work with in the city of Toulouse, which is a beautiful little French uh, city in in south uh, in southwestern France. And we together have dug into the archives uh, of that city and focused on one or two companies that were actually created in 1372 and 1374. So that's like as old as some cathedrals, right? It, you, you know, the, the, these, these companies were created as, as mill companies. In other words, you, uh, they would take the grain that's produced in that area and mill it into flour. So very basic kinds of economic uh, necessity, almost an infrastructure, if you will. Long story short, we found in these archives the prices and the dividends for these companies going all the way back practically to their beginning. And then the question we asked is a very simple one. What was the risk and what was the return? These companies lasted, one of them lasted up until 1946. So, you know, we've got a, like 500 years worth of uh, analysis of these things. So, the rate of return was about 5% inflation adjusted return. Uh, so, you know, when you look at what people forecast for the stock market return today, eh, 5% with inflation tacked on top, top of that is about what, what people tend to expect in recent days. And it, it, it's funny that, that those companies paid off that rate of return over, over their history. And uh, of course, they did have uh, some volatility and ups and downs and, you know, periods of famine and war and so forth. It, it might have been frightening to be a to, to be a shareholder in this one, you know, in these companies. One's called the Bazakal Company, which is a term for the place in the river that the mill was was using. It's uh, using hydroelectric power, I guess you'd say hydropower to turn the, the turbines. So. When I think about risk and return investing in stocks, I think, well, we found the earliest stock that was ever created, earliest corporation that sold public securities mm -hmm. and allowed people to share in the profits. Uh, it lasted a long time. It generated 5%. Mm, that's, that's sort of a good model for me to, to, to get comfortable about equity investing. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and it's it, my sense is that it's easy to take either side of the aisle when you're zoomed in. Uh, when you're only looking at a small time frame in time, you can take either side pretty quickly. And especially right now, if you just look at the last 12 months and you just pull up Google Finance and look at the S&P 500, it's very easy to be a pessimist. Now, if you zoom out as you have, and I think this is the big takeaway, and this is my big takeaway from this, zoom out and look at it from a historical perspective, look at it over uh, decades and decades or even centuries as you have, it's very difficult to be a pessimist around investing when you take that type of stance. I agree with that. Now, you also asked me about some real experts in the world of investing like Ray Dalio. And his firm really ha is based on the idea that with, with serious research and analysis, you can do some forecasting about what kinds of economic bets might pay off. And that's certainly, uh, that's certainly possible. A and I would say there are firms, uh, let's say global macro hedge funds, which is what his firm is often referred to as, Certain firms have been really successful over their over their uh, lifespans at making informed and uh, and profitable bets on the twists and turns of the global economy. So, you know, I'm not a I I, uh, I also believe in skill in investment management, but um, the people I think that are able to profit from forecasting shorter term trends are people that um, have built organizations that can absorb all sorts of data, uh, analyze it with you know, business acumen, but also intense quantitative techniques that, uh, that the modern world allows us to apply to these problems and take positions in markets in, in a way that uh, ordinary investors like myself really have no advantage whatsoever in in, in doing. So um, you know, I I, I don't want to be the patsy walking into a poker game where there are people that have been making money out of playing poker for decades, and that's what you know you risk doing if you're speculating with your money on shorter term trends in the stock market or for that matter the currency markets or crypto or all sorts of possible asset classes that are available today well you don't want to sit down with uh, a bunch of people at a poker table that either are incredibly more skilled than yourself or have never played before, right? <laughs> you, you have that, that, so that dichotomy. And when you look at this today, you talked about the benefits of uh, the average Joe being able to invest and purchase and in, in you know, publicly traded companies and how, how beneficial that is for the average individual. I, I don't, I feel like there's also a downside to that. I feel like there's also a con to that. It's not all pros that we all have access to the markets and have the ability to trade today because we're, we're, we're not all carrying the same level of expertise. And I think you see this with uh, the meme stocks today, the Bed Bath & Beyonds, the GameStops, AMCs. You have more technical trading, tactical trading. You have more day trading today. And some have said that uh, you can no longer trade like Warren Buffett. You're no longer trading on the fundamentals. You can't buy a company simply because it's a fundamentally sound company that's going to be around for a long time because the game has changed. Now, do, do you believe we can still invest? This is the question. Do you believe we can still invest as Warren Buffett has always professed by companies? Well, yes, of course we can still invest by focusing on value. However, when you do so, don't expect that you're buying some, some stock uh, at a uh, at a discount, or don't expect that you're you're buying something that um, other people don't realize also has value. So you know a solid uh, a solid equity portfolio of of stocks that uh, that have uh, great long term prospects. That that's a good thing to do. And of course, diversification is important as well. It's just that w when I do something like that. I don't expect to beat the market. 
you know, I don't expect to get anything more out of it than what the um, what the consensus value is that's being set by, you know, expert trading in 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 the market. Now, when I, I want to shift to some more uh, technological advances, more from a, a technology standpoint, how you view things today. And if you look at the problems that we're attempting to solve today, uh, throughout history, what have what are some of these problems we're attempting to solve today that have already been solved in the past? Well, you know, there are lots of problems, but let's start with ES, uh, with, with the environment. I think um, the global warming is something that ever that's on a lot of people's minds, both in the world of finance and, of course, outside the world of finance. You know, I think uh, that it's going to require... Uh, an elevated level of infrastructure of some sort, either an infrastructure for different kinds of energy production, different kinds of transportation, or ways of mitigating uh, carbon in the atmosphere that probably involve high tech. There are civilizations in the past that have, have been extraordinarily ingenious at managing their physical environment through large-scale infrastructure operations. You know, some of the, well, the Romans, for example, built these roads that stretched across Europe and uh, in Asia Minor in a way that nobody had ever built roads before to move uh, people and armies back and forth. The uh, ancient uh, civilization of Cambodia the, um, uh, you know, the people think about this famous place called Angkor Wat, which is a, a vast temple in, in what is now uh, practically jungle. But in, the, in, the, in 500 AD and 600 AD and 700 AD, the people that built that um, figured out how to, how to um, create what essentially was a mega city interspersed with ponds uh, and, and hydrology that actually allowed that vast building to, in a sense, float in order to manage uh, its stability. It, so when you visit places like that, you realize people thousands of years ago had the engineering skill, but also the capacity to marshal the efforts of people that that were were necessary to build those vast structures, pyramids of Egypt, things like that. I mean, when people say, oh, the, the United States can never uh, really organize itself to, to have electric car networks across the country, I think that's almost a comic uh, <laughs> assertion when you compare it to what, how the uh, Egyptians and the ancient Cambodians and the Romans and so forth managed their environment in, 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 and achieved this sort of giant step forward in the capacity of, of, of creating uh, urban life. Well, that's a beautiful thing about history, right? As you look back throughout history, you get those stories of humans overcoming and using their ingenuity and capabilities to continually overcome obstacles. And again, that has to lead you to a pretty optimistic position uh, for where we find ourselves as an economy, as a society, as as a world in whole. And I, I, I really love that. So I, I love a, a good optimist. I love a good optimistic story. And I think there are just so many throughout history that you can find one after another. When you look at where we're at today from a technical, technological standpoint, are there any financial technologies that you're keeping the closest eye on that you feel will have a monumental impact in our continued growth as a society? Uh, yeah, a couple of things uh, to mention in that vein. If you want to get a big job done, a big thing built, a transformative uh, infrastructure, you have to suddenly focus a lot of, of resources, financial resources. It takes money to hire people to build things, for example. And that's where, that's where the world of stocks and bonds comes in. The capacity to issue bonds, let's call them green bonds, to transform the sewer systems of the world. 
So uh, financial technology is just part and parcel of the practical technologies for solving problems. I'm very excited about the financial technology of uh, Ethereum. It's a blockchain technology. It's one of a number of blockchains. But I, I'm uh, surprised you didn't say blockchain as a whole. You went straight to Ethereum. Yeah, because what I what I found exciting about Ethereum is the flexibility for contracting and um, the ability to use that tool to build new kinds of companies. Uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, for example, that that people are now experimenting with. I'm not sure where it will go, but the, the flexibility of that contracting medium and the creativity that people are bringing to it extends so far beyond, let's say, cryptocurrency that I, I'm uh, I'm just eager to see what the next uh, ideas will be, what the next kind of organizations might emerge from using uh, from using blockchain. But Ethereum comes to mind as something that was designed as more than crypto, something that is a is is its own medium for for creating economic uh, structures. Well, before we get any deeper into that particular topic, which I was really excited to touch on with you, you're really good at distilling complex subjects and taking them down to an easy to understand format. I, could you explain in simple terms, what is cryptocurrency? What is blockchain? Sure. Blockchain in its simplest form is a set of electronic records that are uh that are permanent and, and unchangeable. And so, you know, uh, if you're contracting with somebody or if somebody's made you a promise and they don't fulfill it, you want to be able to go back and say, wait a minute, you promised me this. Or for, a, for cryptocurrency, uh, you paid me so many bitcoins and you don't want to have any capacity for somebody to argue or present alternative uh, evidence to contradict your your understanding of the transfer of value or the or the creation of a promise. And so that's that's all the blockchain is. It's a it's a a set of permanent records that build in a chain one on top of the other, happening through time. And there's a there's a, a process by which they are are validated as unique records. So that you've probably heard about crypto miners. That's that's the validation process. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's not nothing much more than the system that that has existed for thousands of years. You know, in in. Uh, uh, let's say in 15th century France, when somebody wanted to sell somebody else a farm, they would go to a notary. That person's job was to write down what the terms of the transaction are and to keep that as a permanent record. That's, a, that's the blockchain. And interestingly enough, those, those, uh, those notorial records from the Middle Ages on forward they're just a string of events in a notebook that don't have any organization other than they happened in a sequence, just like the blockchain. You go all the way back to Mesopotamia and the first cultures that were writing, they were writing on clay, and then the clay would dry, and you can't erase, you know, you can't erase something that you put into a ceramic document. And so, again, this notion that you need a, a way to permanently affix a, a, a record of a transaction or a promise, that's all blockchain is. Mm -hmm. But people get excited about it because it's no longer got much of a physical presence. Although, try to tell that to the people that are pumping energy into the crypto miners. Uh, you know, the physical presence actually uh, is now, uh, you know, there, there are big buildings that are devoted to this and computers and so forth. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been a long, there's a long history of this and, and, and it's, it's uh, something that people are now 
really able to take uh, increasing advantage of to do all sorts of creative uh, deals, but also make creative things. Well, then you get to that word cryptocurrency, uh, keyword currency. Uh, you just spoke about Ethereum in a context that maybe some haven't thought of before. Uh, everyone or quite often individuals are thinking of cryptocurrency as a currency. When you talk about Ethereum, you talk about it as an infrastructure technology versus a currency. So mm -hmm. is cryptocurrency a currency? You know, it's funny. Whenever there's an, a news article about cryptocurrency, there's a picture of a coin, like as if as if the artists, as if the uh, journalists need to show you a picture to make you think about it as a real physical thing. And so the the graphic design that's gone into imagining a a hypothetical Bitcoin is just fascinating. Uh, but you know, Bitcoin and uh, other cryptos with a few exceptions, are not yet feasible as an alternative currency in the way that we would imagine the U.S. dollar or the euro or the yen might be. But one of the important things that, something that's vital to the economy is to have some reasonably uh, reliable uh, store of value where it doesn't fluctuate like crazy. It doesn't fluctuate like the stock market. Uh, it's something that um, over the short term, you can trust that you put your money in a lockbox, it'll be pretty much the same thing as, as when you need to, to take it out and buy something. So the volatility of something like Bitcoin, or for that matter, Ethereum as a, as a so-called currency, is that it, um, it moves up and down so much that you feel like your 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 value of your crypto wallet can go up like 20 times and then drop down 10 times so that's not what money really that's not a it's not serving a basic function of money uh per se it's something else you know there have been attempts to create stable coins mm -hmm. and to try and solve that problem but those attempts uh, run into all the same kinds of issues that uh, that banking that, that confront people creating standard financial institutions like banks run into, which is you can try and promise people that you'll deliver them a, a dollar in the future if they if they deposit a dollar today in your bank. But if you take all their dollars and go out and speculate on all sorts of things, well, there's a chance that your speculations won't pay off. And, the, and when somebody wants to collect their dollar, they're not going to get it. You know, that's what banking regulation is all about ever since, you know, the early part of the 20th century is trying to control uh, the, the capacity of banks to take too great a risk so that people will be able to save their money. Um, when for when they need the liquidity when we look at something like usdc it's not really a new currency i mean most of it is still based on the u.s dollar something like bitcoin though there you have something that is really attempting to be a currency right uh, versus ethereum that is more of a technology platform when you look at bitcoin in a historical perspective you look over the last hundreds and hundreds of years does, do most currencies or does every new currency introduction uh, deal with the kind of volatility that we're seeing today? And if so, when does that smooth out? You know, it's hard to separate currency uh, from the definition of a nation state. I'll give you an example. The first paper money that was created was created in China in about oh, 1100 AD, so about a thousand years ago. And <clears throat> it was first invented by merchants as a way that they didn't have to pass the heavy coinage around when people were buying stuff. But that led to a crash. One of the merchants at least figured out that uh, they didn't have to have all the money yeah. in the bank 
uh, under in the till when somebody wanted to, to cash out. So the Chinese government stepped in and then nationalized this idea of a currency. And China's paper money lasted for, uh, well, I don't know, for about 300 years until, uh, until the, the country itself, the rulers themselves figured out that they, the printing press allowed them to, uh, to inflate. But countries these days have figured out that, that um, in some sense, it's useful to have a monopoly uh, on the national currency. The dollar is, of course, a great example because it's more than just a national currency. Right now, it's an international currency. But having the ability to increase the money supply or decrease the money supply in order to manage the economy is something that 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 rulers and countries have figured out over over the last few hundred years is a is a is an important part uh, of uh, uh, of let's say stabilizing things or uh, allowing them to finance things and the worry of course that nations have is that somehow if we allow the flowering of many different cryptocurrencies and the use of an alternative medium of exchange for, for purchasing cars and so forth, that <clears throat> nations will lose an important tool for managing managing risk and, 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 and so forth. So that's the tension I think that has emerged in the last 10 years as cryptocurrency has, has become increasingly popular. Uh, will it erode the power of the state to uh, to deal with to, to deal with problems that um, it has to deal with? Mm -hmm. And I assume that's why in one of the podcasts I listened to that you uh, spoke directly about cryptocurrency in, uh, you said it will never replace traditional currencies. I was surprised to hear a historian use the word never, uh, given that <laughs> things always tend to change throughout history. But is that really at the core of your reasoning why cryptocurrencies will never replace traditional currencies? Well, I think even in the short term, I think governments will resist. will resist the the use of uh, of alternative currencies um, i think they've been pretty um they've allowed them to uh emerge that's fine but uh alternative payment systems are 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 going to be something that uh, that most governments and i think there's at least one central american government that's embraced crypto but mm -hmm. most governments are going to find to be at the very least a nuisance and uh, at the worst, you know, a challenge to their sovereignty and uh, ability to to serve their citizens. Well, you said something in that interview that I had never heard said before about cryptocurrencies and really just the, the uses of money throughout history. And that was the future being that we're kind of revisiting the past where you would typically have multiple currencies for different types of uses. Can, can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, uh, there have been times uh, when uh, in certain civilizations, both ancient and relatively modern, for example, in, um, in antiquity, grain in Mesopotamia was something that could be used as a, 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 as a system of payment. Well, it's a natural thing. I mean, if a farmer needs to borrow some some seeds to plant, uh, then they're going to pay you back uh, after the harvest in seeds. There's no reason for them to go out and buy silver and, and hand it back to you. Mm -hmm. Although, even back, let's say, over 4,000 years ago, when people were recording value, they often recorded value in, in units of silver, in, in weight of silver. So. Even 4,000 years ago, metal held a special role in, 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 in the definition of money. But there, uh, 
I'll take another historical example. Um, when Shanghai and, and Hong Kong became really important uh, ports in the late 19th century and early 20th century for China, when China began to open itself up to global trade, the, uh, the merchants and the bankers in those cities were quite facile at being able to use uh, Chinese money, Spanish money. You would see, you, you'd see stocks quoted in four or five different currencies at a given time. Why is that? Because those, those cities really didn't have the uh, capacity to say everybody that trades here is going to trade in one currency. They had to be able to go with the, go with the flow. In other words, if the U.S. If the US uh, traders wanted to pay them in silver dollars, that's what they had to take. So they managed that process of uh, being able to convert one thing to the other. In other words, if I'm running my business on Link, or if I'm running it on DOT, or if I'm running it on Bitcoin or Ethereum, it, whatever my medium of exchange is that maybe I'm running my business in, if I'm going to transact with another business, then why wouldn't I transact in the same currency that I'm already running my infrastructure on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, dude, that that is, uh, I think that is something that people should really pay attention to because I think that really is something that'll lead to a lot of understanding around cryptocurrency, but really uh, the the next evolution in what we see uh, in that realm. And now I would be remiss as we come to a close if I didn't ask a question of someone who's an art historian and a financial archaeologist a little bit about NFTs. Uh, we've I, there was just an article recently. You were actually uh, cited in this article at a picture of the Mona Lisa and. Yeah, you know, there, there's talk about uh, the the art market kind of shifting quite dramatically, where historically the art market has been, as you know, an, an area for the elite of society to invest, uh, not a place for the average Joe, such as the stock market, right? We have seen this evolution in the stock market where your average Joe can jump in and buy a piece of GM, uh, but we haven't quite seen that in the art market. Do you believe that NFTs will be a valid place for us to develop pieces of art and a valid place for us to uh, have stores of value that we can each participate in? Well, first of all, NFTs are already a very accessible medium for creating works of art and for storing works of art. Uh, So it's been great to see this development of a technology that uh, graphic artists and uh, well, all sorts. When you when you take a look at the uh, NFTs that exist, it's just opened up a, a new world for artists to create. With that, it's also opened up a world for um, for art to be traded, mm-hmm. and so uh, NFT marketplaces have uh, have emerged, and with some extraordinary uh, events. I mean. Suddenly, NFTs have sold for millions of dollars. Uh, and when I say suddenly, you know, we go back to 2017, and uh, that wasn't happening. So it's a very new and very speculative uh, market. The market, when people began to hear about these big deals, big, big, big transactions, a lot of people began to mint NFTs. A lot of people began to speculate in NFTs. The thought that you could suddenly become a multimillionaire uh, because you uh, you bought a few crypto punks very early on got everybody, including people in the elevated world of Sotheby's and Christie's, got them all excited. And so, you know, if you thought to yourself, well, why not spend a few hundred dollars and maybe this stuff will take off? Well, I think it became a classic bubble. And for an economist, what better chance to study something exactly like the tulip bubble that happened in the 1630s in real time with all sorts of great data. So I have been just, Mm. and I've been working with colleagues, just um, trying to understand what's going on. 
trying to see if we can measure how high prices were and how much they may have fallen and what's the liquidity and and where's the value it's 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 something i'm right in the middle of trying to understand mm-hmm. as an economist uh, hard, it's hard to make a prediction because we've only had a few years worth but the technology is there and i think even um you know if 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 nfts evolve in fits and starts with speculators coming in and out i i I'm sure really interesting stuff will come of it because it's not just to make, you know, pictures, it's some chance to make movies, but it's also a chance to share in the claims on different kinds of things. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a speculator. I'm a, I'm a spectator yeah. in the speculative <laughs> market, but at least I'm an economist that's interested in bubbles and crashes. So there's something for me to do. Oh yeah, I, I am absolutely a spectator, not a speculator. <laughs> it, it's it's not a market that that I'm ready to to dip my toes into. But boy, I cannot wait to see how it evolves. I can't wait to see how your research uh, evolves, and and I look forward to reading that in the future. Uh, Will, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, before you go, I want to make sure we uh, tee up your book to our audience. If you'd like to get a copy of Will's book, Money Changes Everything: How Finance Made Civilization Possible, uh, we're going to be giving it away for free as long as they last here. Uh, All you have to do is this, write an honest rating and review for the podcast on iTunes, and then shoot us an email, info at howardbailey.com with your iTunes username, and we'll send you the book for free. It's really that easy. Well, thanks so much. I look forward to our next discussion around NFTs. (laughs) Super, Casey. It was a lot of fun. So thank you for the invitation. Oh, thank you.